Welcome back, everybody, um, to um, our online summer gathering brought to you by the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. And uh, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, who's John Matthews. John, you are so, so welcome to, uh, to our gathering. And we're, again, I'm telling you, you're going to in for another treat. Uh, the title of uh, John's talk is Druids and Fairies with a question mark. And I think he will elaborate on that as he, as he, as he continues with his presentation. Just a little background on John. Um, John and his wife, Kathleen, uh, have been past presiders of the order. He is an author of only 150 books. And uh, he is a Druid, uh, a teacher of shamanism. And one thing that I find very interesting, he, he's an Arthurian uh, or an expert on or has a, and special interest in Arthurian myth and history. And he was uh, the main consultant for the Arthur film. Uh, so John has been working for years with fairy. So he's this this talk is coming from his own experience of it. So I think, uh, John, over to you. Thank you very much, Ima. And uh, hello. Oh, buddies and friends everywhere. It's great to be here. Um, I wish I was with you all. Uh, it's very disconcerting not to be able to see anybody. So if I make jokes, what's the point? Because I won't know if you're laughing or grimacing. So I won't make too many jokes anyway. I'll try not to. Um, it's good to be here. And I wanted to talk about this particular thing because um, I really haven't ever talked about it in public. Uh, before, except for one brief interview um, on American radio. Um, I've been associated one way or the other with a group of beings called the Shi, who call themselves the Shi, or who represent the Shi. And these, of course, are one of the prime names for the fairy people of Ireland. Um, I guess uh, it's the question really is, the reason for the question mark, um, is, are there connections between Druids and fairies? Well, I looked back uh, in, the, in the last week or two, I've been looking back over some of the great myths and legends, particularly of the Irish people, of the Celts in general. And of course, the fairy are everywhere. Uh, they're not always called that. They're called the Tuathididanan. They're called the Shi. And they have many other names, the People of Peace, uh, and many other names that are uh, for most of us, represent the fairy races. And so, in a way, everywhere in the whole of the Irish and Celtic mytholo mythological world, you'll find these fairy beings. They're often opposed to Druids. You will get the story where the fairy race has done something absolutely catastrophic to human humanity, and in comes the Druid to rescue them. And uh, I'm not going to give you any examples of that because I want to get on to talking about my own uh, experiences in this respect. Uh, but it's there. It's there. Take my word for it. Um, I, I, I want to talk personally now ra rather than talk academically or from a scholarly point of view. I hope you'll understand why. Um, so we, I have to go back in time here, um, back to 1995. Um, and in 1995, I'd been out in the USA uh, giving lectures in Seattle area. And I was on my way home, and I was sitting in the departure lounge at SeaTac, waiting to my, for my plane to be called, and just idly not really thinking about anything, just thinking about how nice it would be to be home. And suddenly there was a little voice in my ear. And I'm not unused to hearing these things because I've always had connections, if you like, with uh, inner worlds that have chosen to speak to me. And, you know, like any sane person, I have attempted at times to shut them out thinking, am I going mad? But in fact, over the years, I've learned that what comes through is usually interesting, uh, if not just to me, then sometimes to other people. In this instance, the voice in my ear said, do you want to be rich? Well, I stopped right then and there because I know, as I'm sure most of you do, that in any story where an otherworldly being comes and offers you and tells you that you're going to be rich, it's usually going to be 
turning into dead leaves next morning. So I didn't really react very well to that. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we're going to send you somewhere uh, in this, in your world, where you will be shown an image. And this image will help you to work with us and to hear what we have to say. So I went, oh, okay then, um, put it out of my mind, got on the plane, came home, got on with my work. And then I received a phone call from a friend of mine um, who we'll call Larry, it's not his real name, but he's an archeologist and he was working on a site uh, just a little bit um, outside Dublin. I can't tell you the name of the place for reasons that you'll understand soon, I think. Uh, I called it Gort Machine, and I wrote a book about it. If I could have the first slide, please, Emma. There should be a slide coming up somewhere, showing you the cover. No? Well, just in case it doesn't come up, this is the book. Ah, okay, it's coming. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is the cover of a book that I wrote, uh, in uh, which was published, not published until um, uh, 2004. The reason for this is because what happened was I went to this site in Ireland, um, and I was uh, taken to it uh, by car, so that I was really could not tell you exactly where it is because it was kind of hidden from me. But I was taken to it by car. And basically, it's a small mound. And my archaeologist friend and his team had been excavating the area, and they'd broken through into this mound and found some interesting carvings inside. And for some reason, even Larry couldn't tell me, um, he felt he had to call me up and bring me out to have a look. So there I was, um, crawling on my hands and knees into this little tiny mound really not very big at all but it went down slightly underground so there i was in this little cavern not yet um and uh <coughs> excuse me and looking across inside with my torch on the rock in front of me was carved the symbol that you can now see on the screen the spiral with the with the line bisecting it down the middle this i later learned to refer to as the great glyph. And basically, as I was then in there looking at this, taking a photo of it, which didn't come out, of course, then taking a sketch of it, which fortunately did, there was the voice in my head saying, when you get home, we want you to print out this symbol and pin it on the wall above your writing machine, i.e. computer. And every time we, you, put, you look at it, one of us will respond to you and we will talk to you and we will tell you what we want you to hear. So all in some doubt, I made my copy and I came home and I made a fair copy of it and I printed it out and I pinned it up over my computer and then I waited. And almost immediately, I became aware of a presence um, in the room with me, next to me, who said, this is what we want you to write down. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I typed fast as I could while this voice dictated to me what they wanted me to write. So I did this every day. I did this every day for a month. And at the end of that time, I had enough for a small book. And I looked at it all, I read it over again and again, and I thought, I can't do this. I can't put this out there because people will think I'm crazy. I had said in print and in public many times rather denigratory things about people who had received texts, um, many of which I still consider to be not that great, um, others of which are certainly interesting. But I felt that this was a long way away from the sort of work I was doing. You know, I've always wanted to do books and always tried to do books that were more to do with the scholarship and uh, understanding of myth, legends, and tradition rather than um, making something that I felt wasn't my words, but words from somewhere else. So basically, I put the, I put the manuscript away. 
put it in the bottom drawer, as they say, and kind of forgot about it. But every now and then, uh, someone would come and visit, and I would tell them about it, and they'd say, oh, could we have a look? Could we, could we have a read? So for a few friends, I printed out copies and handed them out. And rather to my astonishment, they all said, but this has got some interesting stuff in it. Is this you? And I went, I don't think so. So I put the book together again. And then I went, I was on a tour, uh, which I used to do in those days. And we were doing sacred sites around Britain uh, with, a, with a group of American visitors. And I decided that I would read extracts from my manuscript to them as we spent hours in the coach together, as we were driving around uh, all, all, all the sacred sites in Britain, um, I would read bits from the book. And again, much to my astonishment, this is not modesty, it's just surprise. Uh, everybody was going, but this is amazing, you really should publish it. So I thought, Okay, I'll try and do this. And I looked for the smallest possible publisher that I could find. And uh, I, I, I stopped my choice on Lorian Press, which happened to be run by a friend of a friend. And I sent him this and I said, look, you tell me if you think this is rubbish, I won't, you know, I won't be offended. But he said, no, we'll do it. We'll do the book. So this is what came out in the end. The She, um, uh, Wisdom from the Celtic Otherworld, uh, and basically, it was the it was the manuscript more or less straight as I had received it, with a few extra notes, with a few uh, little background details about how it had come about, and so on. And of course, it included the great glyph. And one of the things that my communicators had said to me right from the start was, "Anyone can use this. This is not yours. We are giving this freely to your species to do with as you like. Anyone who takes this and chooses to work with it." We will respond in some way if it's appropriate. Well, since then, quite a few people have worked with this symbol. Um, in America, particularly, especially around the Seattle area, where I did some workshops, um, people have formed a small community. Uh, some of them may even be tuning into this now. I hope you are. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of the word spread, much to my astonishment. And I think the astonishment of the publisher, it became a kind of mini bestseller. It sold very well uh, in the States. Lots of people bought it. Lots of people were using it. I sold quite a few copies here. One or two good friends like Emily Carding Allen, for instance, made a she uh, tarot, uh, devised entirely by her own, by her own in interpretation, but using the she glyph throughout. Uh, later on, my good friend David Spangler did a book uh, called Talking with the She, in which he made his own connection, not with the same being that I felt I was working with, but with one from the same group. And this was also set in motion, uh, a, a whole uh, raft of material that he then produced. So I thought, well, um, this has all been, this is all fantastic, this is wonderful. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna hear from them again. I felt that, <coughs> excuse me, I felt that um, what they had said was all they had to say, and uh, that that would be that. Well, not so. Fast forward to 2017, and suddenly, one morning, I wake up, and I hear this voice in my head saying, we are the she, we're back. We want you to make an oracle this time. We want you to make an oracle of the shining moon. And I said, um, how will I do this? And they said, well, you are aware, I'm sure, of all the many symbols that are carved into the stones all across the country. Can we have the next slide? Hopefully we've got this in the right order. I think we have. Yes, there we are. So basically what we were looking at these are all actual symbols copied directly from stones found across uh, across the across britain and ireland mostly i have to say these are from scotland because there seem to be more up there than anywhere else and some of you who may know of these may even recognize them um what happened was i contacted my friend will kingan with whom i've done many other uh, um, tarots and I said, look, we've been, I've been given this job 
he didn't think I was mad. Uh, and I said, this is what we're supposed to do. We can go and look for these things. But in the meantime, we need to get lots of books showing photos of these things. And we need to go through the books. And every time one comes up that they want us to use, we'll get a nudge. So that's what we did. We, we ended up with a pile of books about these mysterious uh, carvings in the stones. And we sat there and we turned the pages. And every time one came along that felt right, we'd get a little nod from the she saying, uh, this is the one we wanted to use. We ended up with 40 cards. And this was the beginning. This was the, the, uh, the she oracle of the shining moon, which was duly published by Lorian. And I, again, much to my astonishment, it was very successful. I did some more workshops. Uh, we had groups working with them and the splinter groups began to spread right across the, the right around the globe the different people using these and they weren't that easy to find because they were a small publisher it wasn't one of those things where you could simply hop onto amazon you can now by the way if you want to um you most people bought them from us but the word spread it was literally a word of mouth thing it was a bit of a phenomenon really not at all the, what i'd expected so we did that and yes it was quite successful, and I thought, right, that's it. That's it with the she. We've set this in motion. Things are going to keep working. I'll keep on using the material. I'll give talks a little bit about it. But I never really talked about how all this originated. I only talked about the way in which it worked. So um, that first one was published in 2018. And in the same year, there they were knocking on my door, as it were, again, to say, we've got another one for you to do. <coughs> Sorry about this. If we dry here. Um, and what we want you to do this time, uh, we want you to make a new oracle, which is called the Oracle of the Fleeting Hair. Now, I was actually outside in my garden, um, almost dozing off, uh, having been reading out there, and suddenly there was this whole picture in my mind of a complete series of images. Can we have the next slide, please? Here we are. Um, these are four cards from the Oracle of the Fleeting Hair. Um, the first one, by the way, had 40 cards. Each of the ones that followed, and yes, there are more, had 20 cards. So in the end, we have a 100-card deck here made up of four separate sections. Anyway, there I was um, out in the garden half asleep and suddenly I had all these pictures running through my head and all these ideas and I had to grab a pad and write as fast as I could and then I got back in touch with Will we talked about it all we looked at lots of pictures of hairs uh, and the hairs as I'm sure most of you know are very sacred and were very sacred and are very sacred to the Celts so you've got stories like um you know before <coughs> <coughs> before um the great battle in which Boudicca trounced the Romans um, in order to test whether or not she was going to be successful. She concealed the hair under her skirts and then at the last moment lifted the skirts and off went, ran the hair. And according to the way the hair ran across the field, that was to tell her and everyone whether or not they were going to win. And it did indeed say that they would. And of course they did. So the hair has always been seen as a as a creature of great power and and as a sign of a magical or extraordinary events to come and this is why we ended up with another 20 cards showing different hairs doing different things hairs at night hairs in the day hairs showing us visions hairs hiding in the mist hairs coming out of the mist um and uh, in 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 less than a year this was done and joined the first deck the, the moon deck once again, the response was absolutely extraordinary. People were buying this, they were using it, they were working with it. And all of the time, I'm just thinking, is this really happening? Am I doing this? Or is she doing this? I'm not one of those who just accepts whatever it is that comes to me. Uh, I have to test it. I have to try and find out for myself. So, of course, I did a lot of tuning in myself to the she and working with them. Um, but it was enough just to get this second oracle out. And I thought, once again, that's it. No. We want you to do two more. Really? 
I said, yes, they, they said, yes, we want you to do two more because then you'll have each one will represent one of the elements and then we'll show you how they all work together. So um, I was I said, well, right, what's the next one to be? The next one is going to be the Oracle of the Flowing Waters. Next slide, please. Oh, all right. Doesn't matter. We'll, there we go. Flowing Waters. Um, and um, this one was all about the magic of water. It was about whirlpools, the churning waters that you can see there. It was about silent pools in the mountain. It was about looking for mysterious figures within a waterfall. Um, just the whole power of the water of life itself. And once again, Will did some absolutely amazing pictures that you can just see four there, but believe me, they're all really extraordinary. Um, and so, of course, this was quite clearly representing water. So we had the moon was to represent air, the hairs were to represent earth, this was to represent water, and the last one, if we can go back to the previous thing, was, ah, other way, other way, woo, back. That's it, thank you. The Oracle of the Shining Sun. Uh, that was the last one that we worked on. And this was, of course, to represent fire. And it represented, the, it, it's a much more cosmic, as you can see, I think. Um, it was about the energy from the heart of the sun. It was about solar rays, solar power, um, about the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time, about eclipses, about creation and the end of creation. All of that was included and packed into these uh, these extraordinary images and this is really will tuning into this as much i mean i would i would basically sit here and i would write a list of names and um sometimes i had no idea what any of them meant uh and sometimes they'd come with an image and i i can't draw but i would describe what i was seeing and will would then go off and write it so uh, to, uh draw it rather and paint it so we ended up then with that one so that gave us all four. So if we go on, I think two more. There we are. So uh, there are the four. Uh, the last ones, the last two two lots were put out under slightly different titles. We had two together. Uh, the, the 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 sun and the waters came out as the vision of the she, and were packaged together. And we also at the same time repackaged the other two as well. So we ended up with all of these, and only recently. Um, I think possibly the next slide shows this. I hope. Not sure. No, never mind. Okay, leave that one there for the moment. But there is, there is one last one which is not there. But this is the latest version, the Circle of the She, which combines all four of these um, extraordinary packs. And this one, in this in this instance, as I began to put these together to make one complete collection, uh, I began to get instructions about how the four of them could be used. We were given diagrams. We were shown patterns that we could look for, crossing one after the other. We were given a new version of the she uh, glyph showing how to lay out cards from each of the decks. Um, and we, along this with this came lots of instructions. And then at the very end, we were given one last picture, which was called the last star. And the she said, this is a vision of some time in the future, probably billions, trillions of years in the future, we hope, in which all the stars had gone out and there was only one left. And when we look out, that is what we would see, one star before that too winked out, presumably um, taking us with it. So. Given that all of this last part of this work was going on while we were living through the pandemic and all of the, the fears and uh, unfortunate things that came to that and all the loss that came to that, inevitably, um, when I gave a very brief talk about this, the question came up, um, what do the she say about what's happening at this moment? Well, their answer was not the final star, but they did give me um a, a thing to 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 put into the last book and i'd like to just read that to you um so this was when i talked about the way that um 
the, the world seemed to be breaking apart. We were losing direction. Um, we were becoming, we were drifting. Everything was beginning to change. 2020, year, the year the world changed, perhaps forever, and hopefully for the better. This is what they said about it. We have foreseen the breaking apart of your kind for long ages. Now it is upon you, and you must work hard using all of these qualities to rebuild for yourselves. The world we all inhabit is changing with each day. You must change also if you are to survive. The work we offer you as a token of our belief that our two kinds may grow closer until there are fewer differences or understandings between us. To this, even those amongst us who have less liking for you are agreed. We greet you with kindness and ask only that you follow this path we have set before you for as long as you may. I should explain that at a very early point when I was receiving the material for the first book, uh, <coughs> they told me that there were two uh, two basic courts, <coughs> what are called the Seely Court and the Unseely Court in folklore. Um, and the Seely Court are the ones that were liking us and the ones that I felt I was communicating with. <coughs> the Unseely Court uh, were the ones who were less friendly towards us. They also told me something very interesting that I've never forgotten, and that is that we share the same space. We don't see each other, and we don't very often interact with each other, but in actual fact, we overlap, and we live at different dimensions within the same area. And they also said that what happened in our world affected them, just as sometimes what happens in their world affects us. <coughs> really sorry about the cough. Um, <clears throat> so that's what that particular message was about. Then someone uh, in a workshop I was doing asked a more specific one and said, well, what about what is actually happening right now? What about the pandemic? What about COVID? How are we supposed to respond? And also, what are we supposed to do about what's happening to the world? So this was their response. The new direction you have sought for so long is close at hand, closer than ever before in both our histories. Many things have been brought together and many more are dissolving in this very moment. Everything now depends on what choices you make as a species, race by race, country by country. The earth is listening. The holes in the fabric of your world and ours, so closely related, have become larger and a drifting apart has begun. Be it understood that both our peoples will continue, but the paths we have walked together these many days may begin to diverge. Listen well to these words. The choices you make are essential. They may not be the ones you considered or for which you are prepared, but they will bring about great change. For good or ill, you've taken fresh steps. Remember this as the times change. Remember, the earth is listening. <coughs> that phrase, the earth is listening, has come to me many times. Um, and I think it indicates very clearly what many of us are aware. And I know that within Obod especially, there is a very strong uh, feeling about the natural world, our relationship to the natural world and what we can do to help it. It seems to me that this was the message that the Shi were making. And with it, they gave the following blessing, which um, I will, if I may, share with you all. And this came with the picture of the last star. The light of moon, the strength of earth, the knowledge of the winds, the song of the waters, the warmth of the fire are with you already. Their blessing is ours to give. We give it freely. We are the she. And that was where things stood at the moment, certainly, with all of this. Um, I followed this course, hoping that it would have value for other people, um, hoping that it's not madness, that it's not me hearing things, or literally hearing things, um, and that it will um, be beneficial. Certainly, the response I've had from people has been absolutely amazing, and I've heard some extraordinary stories. So I wanted today 
to throw that out to all of you um, in in the order and friends who are listening, uh, just to see how you react to it and what you feel about it. It's not just a plug, I promise you. You can, of course, order any of the decks from us at halloquest.org.uk. Um, but it's more about really needing to get the response of those who share so many of my own beliefs and ideas, uh, especially those in the order who are great friends and with whom we have discussed things of this kind for many years. So <coughs> I'm going to stop. You'll be relieved. I'm going to stop talking for a minute and try and get rid of this sore throat. Um, and in the meantime, I think there will be questions coming in. And uh, when they pop up, I will try to answer them. That's what we're going to do. Am I right? Absolutely. Thank you so much for a really, really um, uh, and actually there's a comment from Kathleen. It's good that she's watching you. Oh, is she? oh no. <laughs> John will respond later for himself, but I can say from my experience in my shamanic practice, it is that everyone has their own has their one star which animates our soul. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Thank you. I have, this, this thing only appeared, of course, when I started talking. <laughs> okay, so there's one question from Jennifer here. Um, do you feel the Fae are literal physical beings or are they metaphysical projections of some form of energy or indeed external projections of our own subconscious? Well, I can only say that... Um, when I'm speaking to them, I'm very conscious of a being that has a particular appearance to me. Um, they look, I guess, something like Tolkien's elves, if you like. And that may very well be because that's what's in the back of my mind. And I've been told more than once by beings I work with in my shamanic teaching that um, they look into our subconscious to see what it is that we see that means something to us. In other words, the appearance that I'm getting may not, in fact, I know it's not what they actually look like. I did say to them once, what do you look like? And they said, we are blue. And that's all they would say. Um, so I guess that they look the way we want them to look in some way. As to whether they are physical, I think they have a physical reality in their own dimension but not so much in this one. Mm -hmm. By the way, they really hate being called the fairy. Sorry. <clears throat> fairy, fairy is fine, but fairy, that's not it. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Hope that answers. Okay. Um, another one from Francis. That glyph is very similar to the Shokurei symbol in Reiki, and there's a number of comments to that. Yes. Yes, I've been told that lots of times as mm -hmm. well. It's not exactly the same. Um, it, I think there, there is a kind of uh, little, kind of almost a bulb on the end of the downward stroke that, um, that doesn't yeah. appear to that one. And the number of spirals is different. I assume this is an accident. I don't know. Uh, I don't know any, very much about Reiki at all. I've never done any. Um, but yes, people have pointed that out. But that is exactly what I could put down <clears throat> from the stone inside uh, this little mound, which, was, which has certainly been there for a very, very, very long time. Okay. Yeah, because when I saw it first, I thought, oh, that's like a shokure. And not quite, but very similar to the shokure yeah, symbol. People said that, yes. Yeah. There's a question from Penny. Have you had any experiences of the Unseedy Court? Are they the reason for the traditional prohibitions on how to behave in the other world or in the world of fairy? I think, I, think, uh, I have encountered ones that I think were. Um, they haven't bothered me in any way, but I felt... What can I say? How do you describe feeling a frown? That's how, that's what it's like. It's like I know they're kind of glaring at me, if you like, uh, because they don't. They think we're the we're trouble. You know, they think we damage them. Uh, okay. That's another story. Years ago, again, funny enough, in Seattle, I was driving. Um, I was driving somewhere with my friend David Spangler, and he said, "Why, why can't we see them? You know, why can't we see these beings we're always talking about or talking to?" And I said, well, looking in the mirror, I looked into the back seat and there was a character that I called Taliesin who was sitting there in the car. And I said, well, actually, there's one of them in the back seat now. And he said, really? You know, trying not to get off the road. 
and I, and I said, um, I asked Ali Essin, uh, why don't you appear more often? And he said, because if I did, every one of you would want to come to where I come from. And if you did, you would destroy it. You would just, walk on it with your huge boots and you would destroy it. Which is interesting because the implication there, and I've had similar uh, suggestions from the sea, is that the world is far more fragile than we might think, just as ours is. Um, and there is there are some very close links. But the ones who don't like us are the ones who think we're the main problem. They'd like to, to get rid of us, basically. But the she, the Sealy court, are the ones who want to work with us and want to share their vision. Um, so I think that, you know, they're, and they're the ones that I'm listening to anyway. Okay. This is from Aline. I hope I've pronounced your name properly. John, you said we share the same space. Do you think there are places of time, or times, they might be more accessible to create a contact? I think it depends a lot on what's happening. I mean, at the moment, they seem to be very strong. And I think this is very clearly because of what's going on in the world generally. I mean, everybody, I think, like everyone I've spoken to noticed how from the moment we went into lockdown, from the moment that we were not hearing cars going past or planes flying over, the world became a slightly different place. You could hear the birds singing again. Yes. The air pressure. Everybody I know has said how extraordinary it was. <clears throat> of course, now they can't wait to get back to what is considered normal, fumes and noise and everything. But just for a while, we had a glimpse of what the world could look like and feel like again. And I think it's about that to some extent. But that's one of the reasons why there is this big surge at the moment. I don't know. I think I think we, we look back through folklore and through the reports um, of fairy sightings, and we find that it's pretty, been pretty constant. I mean, uh, there's a wonderful man called Simon Young, uh, actually an academic who uh, works at, uh, at the University of Umbria in Italy, but he's from England. Um, he did a fairy census back mm. in 2017, around about the same time that mine was coming out. And he ended up with hundreds and hundreds of responses from all kinds of people. All he said was, have you ever seen anything that you think might be a fairy? Has any of your family seen anything that might be considered to be a fairy or encountered them in any way? Thousands of people responded. The, the document that he produced in the end <coughs> was um, something like 400 pages. Wow. Reports, they're amazing. If you look, uh, if you search online, folks with the uh, Ferry Investigation Society. There was something that was formed in the 30s by some very eccentric people, which then disappeared. And then Simon has re-established this in our time and is himself producing some extraordinary studies of this, some quite serious ones, not, not flaky, but really serious looking for. And it seems as though right now there's more activity than I've ever seen before. The, the Ferry are here. And they really want to be heard. I'm just one voice giving, giving them a voice, if you like. Thank you. Um, there's a number of questions, similar. I just asked this one, but a few people have asked this. Why do you feel the, um, they have chosen you or given you those um, I to have do? Absolutely no idea, except I assume that they think I'm sympathetic. I am, obviously. Um, as I said, for years, I mean, I, you know, I. I'm a psychic. I can't help that. Uh, it's not a term I like to use particularly, but it's one of those things. I was born with it. Uh, I saw things from the very earliest years. My mother spent a long time telling me I had too much imagination and they weren't real and they didn't matter. And get rid of them. Uh, and for many years I did uh, until I became, you know, interested in, uh, in the esoteric world and joined the group in Sussex that I talked about in an interview with Philip. Um, and that sort of work, works things up in me, if you like. So I've always had sympathy and always had interest. And my my main focus is on mythology and folklore, in which, of course, both of which you find fairy beings very often. You find them throughout the Arthurian legend, everything from Morgan Le Fay to Nimue to all of these different characters who definitely are what is called fairy women. Um, the Arthurian stories are absolutely full of accounts of fairy women or men appearing in court, challenging the knights in some way, um, whatever they are. There's almost, 
there's almost evidence, I would say, in the stories for a kind of, not exactly a warfare, but a struggle between the fairy world and this world, right back in those mythological times. And I think that that comes through, and it's been part of my work for years and years. So I suppose it's not really surprising if the she hit upon me as a as a reasonable someone who would listen. I mean, I feel now, I feel bad in a way that I didn't put this book out, the, the first book out right away. I was kind of, I guess I was a bit ashamed of it. I thought I would look so stupid having said, you know, all received, managed, all received things are rubbish. Now I'm doing one, you know. So I thought, well, that they got me, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably, as far as I know, but I don't really know. I mean, I'm just assuming that they, obviously, they like what I'm doing or they wouldn't keep giving me new things to do. Okay, uh, this is from JJ, JJ uh, Middleway. Are there some mischievous fairies at work with your cough? What's your sense around that? <laughs> Probably. It wouldn't be the first time. Um, as I said, this is only the second time that I've spoken in public about this um, to, you know, to, to a group like this. And uh, I, I, I am still a bit nervous, to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, I thank you for listening and I hope you haven't all gone, right, he's... Mm, you know, but um, it's um, I, I feel it's time. That's that's what I would say. I feel it's time to talk about this now. Just as I talked about my own uh, youthful experiences with Philip, I felt that it, you know, at my age, it's time you talk about all of these things. And I'm going to probably write something about more about my own life life journey at some point, if if spared. So. But yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. The cough, <clears throat> the cough is nearly gone now. You notice <laughs> because I finished talking, talking. Okay, there's a question from Holly. Are there names that the she don't like to be called? I have read many things about what to call them and not to. <clears throat> well, they don't like Fay. That, that's the one that I get most often. Whenever I'm reading something, uh, I mean, this is it's weird. I'm not. It's not that I live here with the consciousness in my mind all the time. But I often get little comments floating from nowhere. So I can be reading some book, and there's, or, or I'm looking on, online or something, and there's this, they are coming here, and they're there, and, they're, and they go, not called that. We don't like being called that. Um, okay. you know, the hidden ones, the people of peace, the she, whatever, there are lots of good names for them in that way. Um, but there's a lot of modern... Um, more new age, I guess, end of things um, that tend to make them seem very, um, very floaty, very fragile, very kind of pretty. The other thing, by the way, is that they hate to be represented as little people with wings. They really hate that. I've, I had a whole discussion with, with the one that dictated the first book to me. <clears throat> and I said that you're often presented as small and winged. And, you know, I could almost feel the the anger about that and they said no we are huge and actually i had a, an idea of them that they were standing at least eight feet tall and then and it almost immediately of them this size so it's like they can please themselves but they hate the victorian it was the victorians and then later walt disney but victorians especially who presented fairy beings as in this form i mean i've just finished um if i can i'll have, to have a little plug um, I've just I've just got, got a new tarot coming out called the Goblin Market Tarot, which is based on Christina Rossetti's famous poem. And it presents the fairies, in this case, the goblin aspect of fairies, in a very different way. And that's what we've tried to do in, in the deck um, that, that's coming out later this year. They're fun, but they're sharp, and they can be very nasty. They, they have a temper, if you like. You know, they're not to be trifled with. I'm sure that many of you know the story, and many of you know stories. I think we talked about it, Emma, at one point about people who cut down fairy trees and the terrible things that happen to them. You know, I mean, I know one person who is known to many of you who whose family did this. They cut down a butrick tree somewhere in Ireland on their land, and the father of the family died almost immediately. Everyone else got sick, and it wasn't until lots of apologies had been made and uh, the, the fairy trees were new trees were planted and everyone was very 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 careful that things you know improved 
I have another question. Have you ever met a person who is part fairy, part human? No, not to my knowledge. <clears throat> I mean, I'd be interested to do so. Um, are a, this is from Pat. Are AE's paintings of the she at all accurate? Very. Actually, probably the best that I've seen um, because they do show that. They show the, the, the majestic quality of them. Um, and I think that, and also um, uh, Emily's, em Emily Carding as uh, she Taro also depicts them in her own style, but very much as I think they can be perceived anyway. But no, AEs are fantastic. I mean, I love his work. Wonderful. Um, she's very pleased with your answer. I'm sensing this across the, the airwaves. <laughs> <laughs> A question from Penny. How do the locals react to your friend Larry? They tend to be fiercely protective of fairy mounds and resent interference. Did he do anything esoteric to square it with them before the dig, do you? No, he's a very hard-headed, ordinary, uh, academic uh, archaeologist. And I mean, he's, I, he said to me afterwards, I don't know why I called you to come out here. Because I know you're not an archaeologist. You're one of those mad people who believe in these things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I didn't. I don't think it's anything but bigotry. I mean, it was a. It was just a small mound in a field. One or two people had said, "You really ought to look at this." They did, I think they dug up some little fragments of bone and things like that. Uh, and so they started the excavation. And what's so interesting is that this was over 25 years ago, and I have still not seen any report, official report of this thing, anywhere. Um, I've lost touch with Larry, so I haven't, maybe if he's listening or if he's tuning in anywhere, get in touch and tell me what's happening. But I haven't seen anything about it, you see. And uh, and I was very, it was made very clear to me by the she themselves that I must not reveal where this is. You know, I, even in the book, I said it's near Dublin, but I didn't even say which direction or how far. So good luck if you're looking for Gort Sheen. But the local people were, were kind of okay. And I had a very interesting evening in the pub when I was over there because I was sort of pulled to one side by several people who said, what are they doing up there? You know, what are they actually doing? Uh, and I said, well, we're, we're just, they're just looking for, you know, the history of the place. And they went, ah, oh, not the sort of history you should be looking for. There were a lot of other symbols on the walls in there. Now I wish I had drawn them all. I think most of them were the same kind of the ones that we had in the, in the uh, Moon Oracle. Uh, but it's just that one that was larger than the rest, right bang in the middle of the wall at the back, just as it is for, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, like where the sun comes in uh, and, and strikes the stone on a particular day. Um, that kind of, it was set up in that kind of way. Not, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry if this is, has already been asked, but what does John think about the connection between the dead and Adini Shi? He's a massive fan of yours and so grateful to have had it. Um, between the dead, well, they seem to, I mean, actually this is quite interesting because I had a whole conversation with them about well, their understanding of death. And they said, we do fade, um, uh, but we are very long lived. Uh, we don't have, we don't have, new, have newcomers, uh, children, I think they meant very often um but there's almost no there's there, there's they seem to have no concept of death in the way that we do um I, either as a as a jumping off point or as an end they seem to think that they become they fade back into the background almost if you like uh into the universe uh, which gave them birth and i think that they've had they have a lot of very interesting old traditions that chime very much more in with the the writings of the you know the classical uh, philosophers um, understandings of things um, you can read Plotinus and you'll find bits in Plotinus that chime in exactly with uh, with the kind of ideas that seem to come out of their their world certainly I mean it's like you know one of the reasons why one of the reasons why I didn't publish this straight away was because in a way if I say it's obvious it was because I kept thinking, but I know this already. And they included quite a few little exercises, quite short, very brief, very simple things. And I said, but 
everybody does this already. It was like, lie under a tree, look up at the tree and meditate. And they said, well, okay, everybody does this, but what's wrong with repeating something that works? So I put it all in, you know, uh, and apparently, so I've been told people do have quite profound experiences from just these very, very basic uh, techniques, you know. And since then, it's got more complicated with teaching us how to work with the cards. The cards themselves are like windows. That's how we see them anyway. Um, when you When you look at this, you are looking at a picture that's been painted uh, on this card. But if you sit and look at it, if you really sit and look at it, uh, you you can go through it, and you can be you can find yourself in in the place where that description is happening. And there are words, of course, that go with each card in the in the accompanying book. So it's like any kind of oracle; it, it does answer things. But it's more to do with, I think, opening the way between the worlds and letting us, you know, become more 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 accepted by them and closer to them thank you um what about the she in america this is from amanda wolfhara uh well they're certainly there um i've as i said i've taught in fact all this began as i said maybe you missed that at the beginning but i was this all started at SeaTac airport uh in seattle um and that was the first time i heard what i now think of as the voice of the she and the other interesting thing, by the way, is I never know if it's the same one. I, if I say they all look the same, it's like they all sound the same in some way. And yet I know that they're, sometimes they're different. And I've never been able to get any names. I did once make the mistake of saying, tell me what your name is. And after a lot of humming and hiring, he, she, or it then said a long string of syllables, which I still can't put together. So anyway, um, but no, I mean, yes, the she are in America. Um, there are fairy beings in America, and they were there long before we arrived, as they have in other countries. I always remember years ago, my very good friend, um, R.J. Stewart, was moving from England to live in America. And he said that when he got to the airport, finally to leave England to go and live there, he said, I saw a whole line of fairy beings standing in line behind me and they all had their suitcases and they were coming along as well <laughs> uh, it's a lovely way of seeing it but um there's something about that i mean they come with us when i've been out there i found a very strong welcome from the ones that are there and and a welcome for the ones that come with me because again the first time i ever went to teach shamanism in in america and i felt very diffident about this because um, you know, they have their own tradition, obviously. Native American shamans are very, very powerful and very important people within their culture and within the Western culture. Um, and I was thinking, well, is this okay? You know, I'm bringing Celtic into this land. And as we were flying, literally, as we were, were flying over the American continent, I asked this question. And back came the immediate answer, there are no borders in the other world. Wherever you are, we're there. It depends how you see us. Wonderful. There's a question from Stephen Barnes. Um, have you heard the she making music? And if so, what does it sound like? Not yet. I mean, I think I've heard fairy music, but not. it hasn't been part of the experience that I'm talking about. I mean, yes, I've been to, I've been to fairy, other fairy mounds and places where I know them to be, uh, to be active, and I've heard sounds. And I don't know, it's, I mean, if I said it sounds like traditional music, you know, as in folk music, that would be true on one level, but it's also not true because it's more, there's something more subtle that underlies it that I can't really describe. I don't think there are any words to describe it. It's a sound, you have to hear it in order to understand it. But yes, and I do know several very talented musicians who, I believe can play that music sometimes. I've heard it. Um, a question from Lynn. If more people believe in the she again, will they shine stronger in our dimension? Yes, absolutely. The whole point of this exercise, as far as I can understand, is to strengthen the ties between us. They want us to see them and hear them, and they believe that the way that that happens and what we do 
is incredibly important to both our species. I mean, they've they constantly said, it's not a question of us being wiser than you or older than you, although we are both, little she joke in there. Um, but it's a question of you listening. And it's a question of the fact that you understand that we are in some way related. Not that we are part of the same species because we're not, but we are related through the interaction between their world and ours. <coughs> They're making me cough again, so I must be saying the right thing. And this is from Sandy Coombs. Do you think each of the different symbols within the mound would link to a different realm of the Shi or a place within their realm? Um, that's a very good question. I don't know. Um, unfortunately, as I said, I didn't make um, drawings of all of the other images. I do know that if you look at the, if you if you particularly look at the ones in the in the Moon Oracle, I mean, there's this one, for example, um, which I think is is from Scotland. Um, and uh, I've when I I actually saw this one, and every time I put my fingers into one of the holes, they're not they don't go deep, but the little the little kind of indents indentations, I got a different energy from it. And I believe that when you look at um, something like this, you are seeing three levels, three worlds. And these are all images that tie in with the way in which we understand them. And the reason it's called the, the, the Oracle of the Moon is because our instruction and the instruction to Will was that when we, when we drew it, we had to make sure that either the moon appeared, as in this card, or that each of the car, each of the the designs in there were fi filled up by moonlight. So, as in this one, for instance. So the moon was very is, is and was very important to them, and um, I think that they gave us a series of images that, if we follow them, I mean, it's slightly different with the hares, because the hares obviously are a real creature that we know about. But, but the interesting thing was that when Will was painting these, he was suddenly mo he was moved to do things like when he did this one here, for instance, um, he, 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 all of them have them, but as you can see it particularly clearly, on its nose, he gave it a symbol. And he said these were clan symbols. They were clans within the hair community and also clans within the she community because the she and hares obviously have a very strong connection. So, you know, whenever we're, and there again, you can see it in this one, where the moon is very clearly, you know, outlining the, the hair at night, this one. Um, so there's, over, there's an overlap. And when you put all the four decks together, um, you have this elemental thing and you have this design that shows the, the directions and how they should be focused and how they should be worked with. And so far in my own work with them, the effect is extraordinary. It's almost four dimensional. It's like when you have the four decks together, something else happens. They'd actually said that to me early on. They said, when you have all four, something will happen. And it did put the four together and you get like a fifth element that comes out of them in some way. So we're into the fifth element again with the, the element of spirit and, and all of the things that go into it that don't fit into the other four. Reminds me a little of the fifth province. Um, I've just, uh, Diane asked the question, is the Triskel a she symbol? Not specifically, I think. I think it's one. I mean, I suppose, I suppose in a way we, we did have it. Of course, we've got it here. We've got it here on this card. So certainly it's part of, of their understanding. I don't think it's, I suppose what I want to say is it's not more important than any of the others. Uh, the one that I was given that they always call the Great Glyph is the one that seems to be the most sacred to them. Um, interestingly, because uh, as far as I know, there is no one's yet found one like that anywhere else, only in that one little little mound. But it's obviously one that they regard as very important, and it's the doorway. You know, as I said, I've only got to put it up. I don't even have to put it up anymore. I only have to visualize it, and I'm immediately there. There was a question earlier. Can we use that symbol ourselves? Oh, yes, absolutely. As I said, the, it was a gift. It was a gift to us, from them to us. And as long as we use it with respect, um, anybody who does that, I mean, there is a, if I can just show you something. There's a chap in that 
in, in America who makes these are extraordinary, beautiful things. And this is made of brass and you can spin it. And that is, of course, again, the great glyph, but it's been put into this frame. And these are incredible meditation devices. They're quite expensive. I can put up the details later if anyone's interested. Um, but um, there are all kinds of different ways of doing it. People paint. I mean, if, even in our in this new tarot that I'm doing, the Goblin one, um, the artist Charles Newington, I showed him the Great Glyph, told him about it. Next minute, it's in every single picture in the deck. And I didn't even suggest that. It takes you over, I think, in some way. Another question from Carla. What is the relationship of the she to animals and other non-humans? That's something that's never, that's never actually come up, you know, um, at all. Um, it's not that they're not aware of them. And there's no doubt, I mean, if my, if my cat is anything to go by, when I'm, when I'm talking to them, the cat gives me very strange looks, is all I can say. So whatever it is she's seeing, um, you know, it's something that I can't see. Um, but uh, no, I've never had, I hadn't really thought about this, but I don't think they've ever mentioned our relationship to animals at all. Um, I think I'd probably believe that, you know, with, in this instance, as in many others, that, um, uh, you know, animals see much more than we do. Definitely. John, we have gone a minute and a half over our time. It has been an absolutely wonderful session. Uh, the reaction to um, your talk has been phenomenal and people are asking, and I know Kathleen look, has put in the, the, um, the, the website where people are interested in getting those uh, decks. I'm sorry there's other questions. I'd love to be able to ask them, but we've run out of time. We need to have a lunch break. I want to thank you so much, John. It's been absolutely wonderful. And remember, his talk will be up on uh, on our YouTube and on um, the OBOT Facebook page. So listen, we're going to take a break now until 2 o'clock, and we'll be back then for Penny's talk. And uh, listen, enjoy your lunch. Slongafoil. Thank you very much. Love you, Thanks a million, John.